So we are starting a new chapter, chapter 21 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, and it's on uh, religious worship and the Sabbath day. So again, the, the Westminster Confession is, uh, it's taken us through uh, who God is and who we are and what sin is. And so we, we have a lot of this big theological basis. And now we're, like I said, we're entering into some of the practical things. We talked about Christian liberty last chapter. What does it mean to be uh, free in Christ, to have freedom in Christ? Uh, and now we're going to talk about, okay, in light of our slavery to righteousness, uh, how do we worship God? What, what is it that we, we do to praise God and, and bring God uh, glory and honor? So today we're, we're only probably going to make it just through the first four articles. This is a lengthy uh, chapter, so I just plan we'll, we'll stop there if, if we make it there. Hopefully we will. Um, so let, let me begin by uh, reading the first article here. The light of nature showeth that there is a God who hath lordship and sovereignty over all, is good and doth good unto all, and is therefore to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted in, and served with all the heart, and with all the soul, and with all the might. But the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself, and so limited by his own revealed will, that he may not be worshipped according to the imaginations and devices of men, or the suggestions of Satan, under any visible representation, or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scripture. Um, so the, the first part of this, there's two sentences in this article, and uh, the first part just talks about how, it, you know, in the light of nature shows that there is a God. And we, we talked about this before when we looked at the chapter of of. Uh, of creation. So this, this is really culminating a lot of those theological principles we've already discussed in the previous chapters and, and building upon those things. And so again, in light of that nature, you know, that we, in light that we look upon the world and we, we know there's a God and, you know, some scriptural references, Romans chapter 1 verses 20 and 21 there, Paul introduces uh, this, this letter and he says, for since the creation of the world, uh, his God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. There he's talking about the unbelievers. They're, they're without excuse because it, it's very clear that, that God has revealed himself uh, in, in nature um, and, and that he has presented himself to us uh, in this way. Um, now, of course, you know, we talked about natural theology and how it's not fully sufficient, but it's enough to, to render a person inexcusable uh, for not honoring God. Uh, Psalms 146 verses 5 through 7, uh, here the psalmist is, is praising God and he says, How blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. And he talks about who this God is, verse 6, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and who keeps faith forever. Um, and so we, we, we know that we can see and experience this God uh, through, through nature. And we know that he is sovereign, that he is good, and he does good. Um, and so the confession says, he's, therefore, is he's to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted in, and served with all the heart and with all the soul and with all the might. Uh, so, of course, that last second, last sentence there, with all the soul, uh, with all the body, and with all the might, you know, that's our heart, soul, and might, you know, that's directly from uh, the Old Testament, directly from Jesus' own words with that double love rule about how we're to, uh, to love God with, with our whole self. Uh, Joshua 24, verse 14, uh, this tells us a little glimpse. We're getting glimpses into the, so the words that are, are listed here. Uh, now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. So here Joshua is, is talking to the Israelites and, and he even just says, you know, fear the Lord. And of course, it, it's not just, it's not a fear that we, we're, we're afraid of God. Because of course, remember, if, if we're truly Christians, truly believers, Paul says in Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation. So when we fear God, it's the reverential fear of God, our, our, our honoring of God, our uh, uh, submitting to, to who he is as our sovereign. And so we fear the Lord and we serve him in sincerity and truth. And of course, that service looks like putting away the gods of your fathers uh, who serve. So of course, he's talking about idolatry there, putting away all of that and focusing only on, on God. 
Um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, the apostle says, If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. Uh, so again, just we, we conduct ourselves in reverence to God, fearing God, bringing uh, adoration and praise to God, trusting in Him. Um, and, and of course, you know, there's there's many other words here, but I just wanted to highlight that one. You love, praise, called, trusted in, serve. Uh, all those things are in light of the reverence that is due to God. Um, now, that's the, the first sentence there. And so this worship is natural to us. We know it's natural to us. Uh, and indeed, uh, Calvin wrote in his Institutes what, what I call, what I, what I sort of translate as the innate sense of deity. That's, how, that's what he called it. And what, what Calvin was saying is that uh, every human being on earth has this innate sense of deity. That's why if you look upon the world over all over history, there's always been religion. There's always been religious people. Uh, people have always longed to worship something. Um, you know, that, and that's that innate sense of deity that, that Calvin says that God has given to every human. And I think that's an aspect of being made in his image, is that we want to, we want to praise him, we want to honor him, but of course, we live in a sinful, fallen world, and, and so we, we go astray and we often worship other things. We worship things that make us feel good. We worship uh, things that we think we can control uh, rather than trusting in the sovereign God who's creator of all things and et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, the, the confession can't just stop at that first sentence saying, you know, in light of nature, we, there's a God that we know and, and we, we want to fear him with our and, and worship him. Because the reality is, is, is we want to do that. Naturally, we do, but we don't do it the, the, the way he prescribes it. And so that's why this second sentence is here, um, you know, but, you know, the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself. So, so God has ordained or established the, the way that he wants to be worshiped, the, the way that, that it, it, it pleases him to be worshiped. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter four, verse two, you shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. So Deuteronomy, this is the reiteration of the law. Chapter four comes right before chapter five, which is the, the 10 commandments being spoken again. And so Pretty much all of the book of Deuteronomy is, is taking the Ten Commandments and uh, exploding it and unpacking it, how, uh, how each of those Ten Commands uh, fit into the, the, the life, and, and, uh, life and liberty of, of, the, of the house of Israel. And so uh, here again, just pointing out that there, God is you know, speaking through Moses, Moses speaking to the people, you shall not add to the word which I'm commanding you. So when, when God gives to us a command, and of course this is of all commands, but here we're talking specifically about worship because that's, that's what this chapter is on. We can't add or detract from what God wants us to worship. Now, as we'll hopefully get a little bit later and, and probably not until next week, we can talk a little bit about how the different elements of worship can differ between you know, churches, but by and large, there, there are certain elements in worship that are necessary in order for a, a worship to be Christian and for it to be true. But we'll, we'll touch on that when we get, I think that's uh, Article 7, Article 6, uh, places like that, Article 5, but we'll, we'll probably get to those next week. Um, and again, Proverbs 30, verse 6, do not add to his words or he will prove you, you will be proved uh, a liar. Um, again, all of this stuff is going to be detailed in the following articles, but I just wanted to highlight here that we, stating very clearly that God says we, we can't add or, or take away from his commands, uh, we can only do them, fulfill them or break them. Um, and so we, we are stuck with them. We can't change it. We can't change God's word. We can't change the scriptures to fit our agendas, even our own uh, ideas of, of what worship should look like. Why, why is that though? Why, why is, is there a, an acceptable way that's established by, by God? Well, the, the, they answer in the next sentence that, that God may not be worshiped according to the imaginations and devices of men. Uh, so this goes back to, so thinking about that first sentence, again, 
Worshiping God is natural to every human being on, on earth. But of course, in our fallen state, we want to worship God according to our imaginations or, or using our, our own devices. Um, and, and of course, God wants us to worship him according to what he finds pleasing, what, what he commands. Uh, and as our creator, he he's, has every right to do that. That same Deuteronomy chapter 4, a little later, verses 15 through 20, here um, God, speaking through Moses again, actually tells the, the congregation of Israel some specific things about worship. So it's a five verses, a little bit lengthy section, but I want to read it all to you. He says, so watch yourselves carefully since you did not see any form on the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb from the midst of the fire. So just let me back up a little bit, put yourself in the, in the timeline here. Uh, Moses is, is or speaking to, to, to the people. God has spoken to Moses on the Mount Horeb, uh, you remember he, he gave him the Ten Commandments and, and he spent some time up there. And uh, there's and of course the people, they can sort of see it because there's always this cloud, this smoke around the mountain, but no one's allowed to ascend the mountain or, or they'll die. And so the people know that Moses is talking to God, but since they don't see God or they don't, they don't, they're not experiencing it like Moses did. God is giving them this warning. So watch yourselves carefully since you do not see any form on the day the Lord spoke to you in the midst of the fire so that you do not act corruptly and make a gra graven image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any bird that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the sky, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water. And beware not to lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven and be drawn away and worship them and serve them, those which the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace from Egypt to be a people for his own possession as today. So essentially what, what God is warning, again, God, God knows our, our, our human inclination to, to want to worship something. And so God gives this very specific warning to the people that all right, I know you you didn't see my you didn't see me. You didn't see the experience. You didn't experience what Moses experienced, you know, the 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 fire, the column of fire and all that smoke. You were at a distance. Beware people not to worship or 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 try to idolize in the sense that create an idol of God by worshiping the something created, whether it's an animal or a person or a celestial body, uh, that that's God is, is giving this very specific, clear warning uh, to the people. And of course, we know that this is in, in the commandments as well. Um, Jesus picks this up in Matthew 17, excuse me, chapter 15, verses 7 through 11. He's he says, you hypocrites, uh, and he, of course, is talking to the Pharisees here. Usually they're the hypocrites. You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. And after Jesus had called the crowd to them, he, to him, he said to them, hear and understand, it is not what enters into the mouth that defiles a person, but what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles the man. So, of course, here, we, we talked about this when we, when we looked at that passage in Mark. Um, but again, here, Jesus recognizing that uh, human nature will tend to want to worship something that, that we can see, something that we can grab on to, something that we can wrap our heads around. Uh, and, and again, that was... God's concern for the people that he was warning them is that they, he knew that they couldn't see him. All they could see was this cloud of smoke around the mountain. Uh, and, and again, our, our human nature is want to devise something that we can see so that we can worship it, so that we can, we can honor it somehow. Uh, and of course, God doesn't want that because then we're worshiping the, the thing created rather than the creator, which of course is, is one of Paul's concerns that he levies in Romans chapter one. Uh, and so here again, Jesus is pointing out that one of the, the pitfalls of doing that, when we worship idols, created things, or, or devices or practices of, of human tradition, what we're doing is we're actually falling into or could very easily fall into hypocrisy. Uh, then it becomes so easy to just do the, the, the rote traditions, to, to, to just go through the motions because we've lost sight of 
who the true object of that worship is. If we're, if we're worshiping a, an animal or the sun or, or, or just you know, something that we, we've always done it this way, we lose focus of who God is. Um, and that's the point of worship for us is to remain focused on God, to give him honor and praise. And that's what the second article talks about, that, that worship is God-centered. Um, before we jump there, any questions on that first article? All right, let me read the second one. It's a nice little short one here. It says, Religious worship is to be given to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and to Him alone, not to angels, saints, or any other creature, and since the fall, not without a mediator, nor in the mediation of any other but of Christ alone. So there's three sort of subsections here. The first one is, is very clear. Worship is to be given to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If we aren't worshiping all three persons of God, we are not worshiping. We're, we're not actively uh, doing worship correctly. Um, when we worship God, we worship Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Um, to, to only worship one or to even deny the Trinity uh, is to deny God himself, which we've already talked about that when we looked at the chapter on the Trinity. Um, I want to look at this, uh, unpack a little bit with some scripture from uh, not to angels, saints, or any other creature. Um, this, of course, you know, is, is given to us in Exodus 20. There's the verses 3 through 5, the, the commandment from the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. And it keeps going. Um, so here we see clearly from God that we are not to have any other gods. We're only to worship God and God alone the one true God, and we're not to make idols uh, to, to try and, and mediate between us and God. You know, that's, that's one of the concerns uh, and, and what we'll talk about in the next section when there's a mediator. You know, if, even if a person, especially sometime, you know, if, if you go to the Old Testament and you read some of the stories there, um, you know, for instance, go, go back to this Exa example here in, in Exodus. When Moses is up on the mountain, he's up there for a while, and what happens? The people start, you know, getting angry, they're getting upset. Where's Moses? You know, why is he out here? He's brought us out here to die, you know, all this stuff. You know, they're grumbling, complaining. And we know the story that Aaron says, All right, well, here, let's make a, 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 a calf, and everybody gives him his gold and all that stuff. And, and essentially, what, what Aaron says is he says to them, uh, you know, congregation, this calf represents the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So Aaron doesn't create necessarily a new God in the sense that he doesn't, he's not saying, uh, you know, hey, this is, this is now your God. This is the God who did it. No, what, what he's saying, and he's, again, he's trying to, to be a mediator. He's trying to, to, to have a compromise. He's saying, all right, I know who God is. Because remember, who, we know who Aaron is. He's Moses' brother. God has spoken to Aaron. Aaron has seen the mighty hand of God. So he knows who God is. And then he's got these grumbling people on the other hand, and he's trying to, to, to make, you know, bring some compromise, trying to, so people don't get in the fight, so they don't start running back to Egypt. And he's like, all right, I'm going to, I'll create this, this calf, and, and this will represent the Lord, our God, who brought us out of the land of Egypt. So it's not that, again, it's not that Aaron is creating a new God. He's, he's just saying, this is the image of our God, the one who, who saves us. This is the image. And, and that cow becomes the mediator, you know, between the people and God. But of course, we know clearly idolatry is bad and it's not, that cannot be, a statue cannot be a sufficient mediator. Uh, Christ is the only mediator, which we'll touch on in a moment. And so we see that, uh, even, even when we try to worship God with images in the sense that, you know, we know this is not God, but we, we somehow need to wrap our heads around God. And so we, we use an image of God. And again, that is an error. That is, that is wrong. Um, and the same, you know, we don't do that as much with, with creatures, but one of the concerns of the Westminster Divines is that the church has been doing it to angels and saints. 
And, and that, of course, is exactly what the Roman Catholic Church has been doing and continues to do today. Um, that was what the Westminster Confession, in this particular clause, is pushing against, is the veneration of the saints and angels. Um, and, and one key verse here is, is in Revelation 19, verse 10. Here, John uh, he, he reports that he fell at his feet. And so the his here, the only way to, to find out who that his is, it's in chapter 18, verse 21 of Revelation. And that's the strong angel. And this is a strong angel who cast uh, the, the whore of Babylon into the sea. So he says, you know, he, so John falls at this strong angel's feet to worship him. But he, that angel says to him, to John, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so here we see a glimpse from scripture that, that even the angel says, don't worship me. Uh, you must worship God. Uh, that's the true uh, object of our worship. And, and indeed the angel tells John, tells us that, hey, I'm actually a fellow servant with you. Um, the a angels and humans, we're, we're on the same plane in the sense that we're, we're both servants of God. Now, we're at different levels in terms of power and ability, but we're both servants of God. And we can't worship angels. And if we can't worship angels, you better believe we can't worship people, even saintly people, even people who, who, are, who, are, who have lived their entire life in righteousness because they haven't. They, they, and of course, that's one of the arguments of the Reformation is that there is no righteousness innate to us. That righteousness is foreign to us. That righteousness is given to us by Christ. So any human being who is righteous in this world, and there, and there are plenty, I imagine most of you all in this room are pretty righteous, you're not righteous of your own doing. We're righteous by Christ. And so again, one of the Westminster's, the, the Westminster Divine's position the, and the, the Reformation position has always been we can't venerate saints. We can't pray to saints because they're just fellow servants like you and me. They're just humans like you and me. They might be a little bit more righteous than you and me, but that's only because what Christ has given to them and they have lived into that righteousness. And perhaps we need to live in that righteousness more. It's the same righteousness. It's all Christ righteousness. And therefore, he is the only object of our worship. And so that takes me to that next phrase in that article there. So, you know, and since the fall, not without a mediator, uh, nor the mediation of the other, any other but Christ alone. And so the, the mediator, that true person who can, and the only person who can mediate between us and God is Christ Jesus, not some idol, uh, not some earthly image, definitely not angels, and definitely not other people, uh, whether saintly or not. Uh, the only true mediator between man and God is Christ. G Jesus says in John 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so we, we, you know, we usually talk about that with salvation, which is true. The only way you can be saved is through Christ. But even in our prayer, in our worship, the only way that, that we can worship God properly is not through any other means, any through other object, it's through Christ. When we worship God through Christ, we're worshiping God properly, correctly. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and men. And who that mediator is, it's the man, Christ Jesus. It is him who has brought us to God. He says the same thing in Ephesians 2.18, for through him, that's through Christ, we have our access in one spirit to the Father. Um, that's how we are accessing God properly, mediatorily. And of course, you know, if you go back to the Old Testament, we talked about who Christ the mediator is back in that chapter. Um, we, we know that the Old Testament rites and rituals, those were shadows, but foreshadows of the mediatorial work of Christ. So when God devises the proper worship for Israel, it includes you know, the sacrifices, it includes the, the, the priestly prayers, it includes all those elements of, of the rites and rituals of the temple because those prefigure Christ. They are always pointing to Christ. And then once Christ comes and fulfills all those things, now we, looking back, are properly worshiping God through Christ. So we don't 
we don't do the sacrifices because Christ is our sacrifice. We don't have priests because God, Christ is our high priest. Uh, we don't, you know, we don't do all the things that ancient Israel did because Christ has done it. And Christ is it. And so again, that's our mediator. Uh, and, and so when we are worshiping God, truly Christ-centered like, we're worshiping the triune God through the mediatorial work of Christ our Savior. Any questions on that? All right, we might actually finish early. Article three. This is, uh, I've called this the uh, worshipful, worship is prayerful. Prayer with thanksgiving being one special part of religious worship is by God required of all men and that it may be accepted. It is to be made in the name of the son by the help of his Holy Spirit, according to his will with understanding, reverence, humility, fervency, faith, love, and perseverance. And if vocal in a known tongue. So again, the, the Westminster Divines want to highlight how important prayer is. And, and of course, this makes sense to us. We always have prayers in our church, but we need to put our shoes in the, 60, in the 17th century. You know, we need to jump back, or is it 15th century? I, I, was, I always get that order confused. We need to jump back to 1647. Uh, we, we need to put our shoes there and, and, and think about what the, the church had been worshiping for 1500 years, you know, before the Reformation. Uh, what many people didn't say prayers, or if they did say prayers, it was in Latin. They, they, they heard it from the priest, and so they, you know, they might want to repeat it. But by and large, the, the common person didn't say prayers. At, at most, they would do Hail Marys, you know, Hail Mary, you know, full of great, you know, they, they, would, they would do those prayers. But of course, that's, that's, that's not praying to Christ. That's praying to a, a mediator. Um, that's not, not Christ. Uh, and so, uh, and you know, I think some of them would memorize the Lord's Prayer, but of course, that would also be in Latin, uh, that a tongue that they didn't understand, um, and they just, they just learned it. They had to say it. Some of them may have known what the words meant, but by and large, if you're a peasant, the common person, you're pr you, weren't, you probably didn't even pray. You let the priests pray for you, or you let the nuns pray for you, uh, or the monks. You know, you, you let those religious people pray for you, because as a peasant, you don't know the holy language of Latin. Uh, and, and the Westminster divines and all the reformers say, no, prayer is vitally important for every believer, which is why every believer must pray. That's a commandment from God that all of us are called to pray, not just the priest, not just the preacher, not just the, the, the clergy. Every person is called by God. So prayer is God is by God required in the name of the Son, by the help of his spirit, according to his will. So that required, we get that in First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 11. Uh, here it says, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. And of course, we hear things like this in the Psalms, and we hear this in the Proverbs, this calling of, of turning to God. What else is that other than in prayer? What, what does that look like? I mean, just think of Daniel, who prayed three times a day. Uh, we, we, we know how important prayer is, and prayer is not just for Daniel, who was the nation's prophet. It was for everyone, which is why it was so you know, uh, scandalous that uh, we talked about with the Christian liberty, how uh, uh, Darius would institute that only he would be allowed, could be accepted prayers. If you think about that, if Daniel's the only one who's been thrown the lion's den, all of, of exiled Israel is praying to Darius. They're not praying to God because they wanted to follow the rules. And so Daniel says, no, I know who rightly is the object of my prayer. It is God. And that's the goal of every believer is that we are to pray to God. We are to seek the Lord and his strength. Matthew 26, verse 41, here Jesus is talking to the disciples. Matthew 26 is the Olivet Discourse. Uh, so this phrase is in 
is, is within that context, but it's a context that applies to us uh, today and, and in every situation. It says, keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So again, this is in light of the his end times prophecy. Uh, his concern is that, uh, that people will, will fall away from the faith if we aren't constantly praying, if we aren't focusing on God, if, if we aren't filling our, our every life with, with, with prayers to God. Is that only for disciples? Is, that, is this command only for the clergy of the church? Is this only for the religious elite? Absolutely not. Because he's, he's saying, keep watching that you may not enter into temptation. Are clergy the only ones who, who can be tempted? <laughs> Absolutely not. And so this is a teaching that, that to everyone, that you know, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We all need to be in prayer. Uh, so this is why it's required. And there are many other verses. I just, I just the, the, the vines pointed this one out, so I want to do that. So prayer is required. It's also in the name of the Son. John 14, verses 13, 14. Jesus himself says, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And so when we rightly worship and pray to God, we again need to be thinking about our mediator, Christ Jesus. He's the one who is mediating on our behalf. Uh, he's the one who is, uh, who we, if we pray in his name, he's bringing our prayers to the Lord, so to speak. Uh, and certainly we know that he's our intercessor. So he's praying on behalf of us. You know, Jesus is at the right hand of God and he's praying our name into God's ear every time. All of, all of God's elect, Christ is praying for them. Just read John chapter 17. That's a prayer for us. That's a prayer for the church. And so God is, or Christ is mediating our, our prayers. And this is why prayers are to be in his name. And of course, that's again to, to keep us focused on the mediatorial work of Christ. Um, and it's also through the help of his spirit, Christ's spirit. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 27. This is a great passage here. Paul says, in the same way, the spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. How many times have we struggled with finding the right words of prayer? Um, sometimes it's hard to, you know, we don't know what to say, or, or maybe our mind is so full of things, we don't know, really know what to pinpoint, what to choose, or sometimes we just blurt out whatever. <laughs> Thanks be to God, we have the Holy Spirit, because whether we're saying we're just doing, you know, word vomit or we're saying nothing or we're just confused. If we're sincerely praying to God, whatever we're saying, the Holy Spirit, recognizing, knowing our weakness, prays, he intercedes on our behalf. As he says there in verse 26, you know, we don't know how to pray as we should, but the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he, you know, God who searches the hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit, because he, God, or excuse me, the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so again, it's the Spirit who is uh, this, this, I guess, the, the, the pipeline, if you will, for our prayers. Uh, because we don't know how to pray, because we're, we, we're weak in our prayers, we, we struggle finding the right words, or, or, or uh, you know, sometimes we're praying for the wrong thing. You know, how many times have, have, have we prayed for something and, and it hasn't come, or, or perhaps the opposite has come through because we weren't maybe quite praying for the right thing? Thankfully, the Holy Spirit is praying for us, praying with us, interceding on our behalf uh, so that our prayers will, will, will sort of uh, ascend to the ear of God. This is not the work of any saint. This is not the work of any angel. This is, not, this is no one else's work because it is the Spirit alone. Because it is, you know, as verse 27, God searches the minds, excuse me, searches the hearts that, I mean, let me, I'm messing that up. God searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, you know, because we know that God, the three persons of the Spirit are one. So God the Father knows the mind of God the Spirit because God the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God the Father. And so we are the only way that anything can mediate or in that sense or intercede on our behalf is if that thing knows the mind of God. And the only thing that knows the mind of God is his Holy Spirit. And so that's why we don't pray to angels, we don't pray to saints, we don't pray to anything else other than to the triune God. That's how our prayers are received by him. 
or how he hears our prayers. Now, of course, you know, God is omniscient. He knows all of our prayers and he knows everything that he knows all the prayers of every person on this earth are said, whether they're said to him or not. He knows them because he's God. But in order to be received prayerfully, correctly by him, they are in the name of the triune God, which again leads to the second, that last phrase there, according to his will. Well, what is God's will? If we've ever asked that question, you know, if I say, well, what's the will of God? Well, guess what? He tells us in scripture, First Thessalonians chapter four, verse three, Paul says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. So the will of God is for us to grow in righteousness. The will of God is for us to, uh, to, to become holy, to be holy. Now, of course, we can't be holy in this life, or at least perfectly holy in this life. That glorification is a work of God when we're you know, out of this earthly body and in heaven. But our goal is still holiness. We're still to live righteous lives. And so James says in chapter 5, verse 16, Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective, excuse me, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So what does prayer include? Prayer includes our confessions. Prayer includes our intercessions. Uh, prayer includes adoration of God, praise of who God is, thanksgiving. You know, that was one of the concerns or one of the things that were levied against unbelievers as they are ungrateful in Romans chapter 1. Uh, so our prayers include all these things. Actually, I, I take this from Dr. Sproul, who again, we're, we're sort of modeling his book, Truths We Confess. Uh, he, he sets up very simply what he calls the, uh, the Acts prayer. Let me move it over here. The, there are four simple elements to, to work, to prayer. Um, and oftentimes, if I'm praying extemporaneously during the Lord's, during the pastoral prayer, I'm modeling it after this structure. Uh, so first there's adoration. We, we, are, we are giving adoration to God, recognizing who he is as our sovereign, holy God, as our creator. You know, think about all the attributes of God. When we, when we try to, to comprehend and wrap our heads around who God is, our, our natural proper response is to adore him, to, to, to uh, give him accolades. And then when we recognize who God is, we also recognize who we are and how we fall short of that holiness. And so the second element of, of prayer is confession, which we see here in the Westminster Confession. Uh, you know, when we come to God, we confess our sins, we repent our sins. Uh, we, we know that we sin, we know that we err. And so when we recognize who God is, we recognize how fallen we are. And so we, we ask for forgiveness. And in light of that confession, because we know that God is quick to forgive, when we, when we confess our sins and he forgives us instantaneously, we give thanksgiving. So that's another element of prayer. It's thanksgiving. So we thank God for his forgiveness. We thank God for his grace. We thank God for the very life that we have, the very fact that we are alive right now. It's, it's, that's worthy of, of thanksgiving. Um, and then the final element is supplication. And this, of course, is, as the Westminster says, and as James says, you know, praying for one another so that you may be healed. Supplication is our prayers for others on, our, on others' behalf, whether it's the church, for the world, for those who are sick, dying, whoever they are, whatever, you know, we, we always include them in our prayer requests. That's, that's what we're praying for is the supplications for on behalf of others, on behalf of ourselves. So this is... The, the, the general structure that I follow, I think Dr. Sproul was, was right. I don't know if it's original to him or not, but I, I know I, I read it in his book and, and I, I really like it. It's simple and the acronym ACTS is very easy to, to remember. So that's, in my mind, what, what a, a good, uh, simple and, and effective prayer looks like. So, um, and then the Westminster Divines say that this prayer, when we bring it to God, it's with understanding, reverence, humility, fervency, faith, love, and perseverance. I just want to highlight some verses of these. We do, I'm not going to unpack every single one of these words, but I do want to, to just highlight some. So understanding in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2, the teacher says, Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. 
And that's an interesting uh, thing that Ecclesiastes is telling us. You know, we, we can't be hasty. We can't be impulsive in our prayers. Now, sometimes we, we, we do. And, and again, thanks be to God, the Holy Spirit is there because when we are hasty, when we are impulsive, when, when we don't really know what to say, the Holy Spirit is groaning on our behalf and bringing our prayers to God. But still, we, we need to recognize and understand. So that's why it says understanding. We need to understand who God is, who we are, and, and recognize that we need to be reverent reverential in our prayers, which is the second word, reverence. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. So again, recognizing that this kingdom that has been given to us, again, not something we earn, something that God has given out of his grace through Christ, we need to show our gratitude. Uh, and, and that gratitude, the way we show that gratitude is an acceptable service with reverence and awe. Humility, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Uh, uh, God is speaking to uh, uh, Solomon, I believe Solomon. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Humility is an important aspect of of coming before God. And of course, that, that it makes itself known in confession. The only way that we can really truly confess our sins before this holy God is by humbling ourselves, recognizing that God is sovereign and above us and we are beneath and we need to be humbled. And then there's fervency. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Paul says very clearly, pray without ceasing. Uh, there's there's a, a, a consistency to prayer. Uh, there's an importance of, of, of being fervent in our prayers. Um, now, does that mean we need to be praying every day or, I mean, absolutely every day, but does that mean we need to be praying every minute of every day? Well, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe we can live prayerfully. Our lives can, can, can be prayer. Um, does that mean you, you, you set aside five hours and lock yourself in the closet? Maybe, <laughs> but, but maybe not. Maybe it's, again, it's, it's knowing this, having this sense of fervency to pray, uh, praying with, with consistency in our, in our lives. Faith, it's another important one. James says in 1.6, but we must ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. When we pray, we, we have to pray in faith, knowing and trusting in God. Now that means we might not get what we want, but when we pray in faith, we know that we're going to get what God is going to give to us, what God wants for us, what we need from God. And so when we come to prayer, we need to pray in faithfulness, trusting that God and his sovereign will is going to work all things for good for those who love him, as Paul says in 8, Romans 8.28. And then love, Matthew 6, verses 14 through 15. Uh, here, Paul actually, excuse me, Paul, Jesus ends in Matthew, the first part of, of Matthew 6 is the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, etc., etc. And then he ends that prayer with this clause. He says, for if you forgive others for tra their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. We see that forgiveness is key. And when we think about forgiveness, we, we need to recognize that for, an element of forgiveness is, is love. This self-giving, sacrificial, outward focus, agape love that is so prevalent in the New Testament. If we aren't willing to forgive, that, rec that means we don't recognize that we're forgiven, but undeservedly forgiven by the grace and loving kindness of God. And the last one on there is perseverance, Ephesians 6, 18. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. So when we're praying, when we're praying for a thanksgiving and our prayer of supplication, we need to pray in perseverance, knowing that, one, it's a struggle to be a Christian anywhere in the world. It's always been a struggle to follow Christ fully, humbly. Second, it's hard to follow Christ when society, when culture, when, when, when governments around the world are, are persecuting Christians. Uh, you know, it's easy to say, oh, well, you know, I'm not a Christian. Let me go, you know. Of course, Paul is writing to a church in Ephesus that's dealing with those things. And so when, we, when we're praying, when we're lifting up our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers of supplication on behalf of others, 
recognizing that we need this perseverance. We, the church needs help in persevering through, uh, through whatever situation uh, that we're in. We actually might be in good time. And then the last one I wanted to separate out and say this last sentence phrase here, prayer if vocal in a known tongue. That's a very interesting thing. Something I don't know if we've ever thought about that. The, the quotation here from 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14, uh, 14 through 16. Here Paul is talking about, he's talking about tongues. He says, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. All right, let me pause there. That's, that's the verse that they're referencing. If I pray in a tongue, in an unknown tongue, in a, in a tongue that's foreign, you know, that's not the language that Paul speaks, my spirit prays, so the, the spirit is the thing that prays, but the mind is unfruitful. So if he's praying in a tongue that he doesn't know, he might be praying from the heart, but he's not praying from the head. He doesn't know what he's saying. He doesn't know what, he, what he's preaching, what, what he's praying to God. And of course, you know, put yourself in the shoes of the Westminster Divines. What they are probably thinking of is Latin. How much of the church is preaching, is praying in Latin? And yet how much of the Christian population knows Latin? It's a huge disparity that the, the, the reformers knew. They recognized it. And so if people are, are, even if they are praying the Lord's Prayer and they're saying the right words in Latin or they're doing the Hail Mary in Latin, you know, if they're praying these things in Latin, they might be praying it spiritually, but do they know what they're saying? Do they, do they mindfully understand the words? Probably not. Unless you're a, a Latin scholar, you don't know what you're praying. And so the, for the Westminster Divines, they were making it very clear, and this, of course, is very reformed or re reformational. You, you need to be praying in a language that you know. I think I mentioned this example before. Uh, in Calvin's Geneva, there was a, a group called the Consistory. And this is a Geneva is a weird time. It was, it was kind of a theocracy. So it, it was a, the consistory was the, the state town council, so to speak. But it was, it was manned by elders of the church, by people who were, who were religious leaders in the church. None of the clergy were on it, so Calvin never sat on it uh, far out. None of the pastors sat on this council. But it was, you, you had to be a, a Christian in good standing of the church in order to be on this council. So, so it, was a, it was a weird gray area of, of, of blurring between state and, and church. And the consistory, one of their goals one of, and this was something that Calvin encouraged them to do, was every person who lives in Geneva, especially if they're Protestant, which if you're living in Geneva in the 1500s, you're, you're Protestant, um, you have to load the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and the Apostles' Creed. You need to be able to, to, to repeat those in your own language. So if you're a French refugee or an Italian refugee or a German refugee, you can't repeat any of those things in Latin. You have to repeat it in whatever language you speak, in French, in German, in Italian, Spanish, whatever, in English. That's what you have to, to learn. Because again, the, the reformers knew how important it was to not only say the words, but to know what you're saying. An interesting thing is if a person failed, you know, if they were doing it in Latin, uh, you know, they go up, say it, or, or they're trying to do it, but they, they slip into Latin. The punishment, they weren't thrown into jail, they weren't fined. Their punishment was they had to go to church more and learn, and learn it in their, in their native tongue. Uh, that was their punishment. And so, uh, again, the, the Westminster Divines are, have that in mind. Now, I think this is actually a pertinent one for today. Today, it, there's a big Pentecostal movement. And, of course, I grew up in that. And there was a speaking in the tongues. And, and, you know, we can have a whole conversation on tongues. You know, Paul says if tongues is present, there has to be someone to interpret tongues. Um, you know, I think that's true. And I would agree with, with Paul that, you know, if, if tongues are being spoken. In many churches, though, especially in my experience, tongues was part of the liturgy. And very rarely was someone there to interpret it. And so at that point, tongues became, as the Westminster's Divine said, it may have been proper prayer, spiritually speaking, but do we know what we're saying? Is it mindful? Well, in that case, it's not true 
prayer. And of course, Paul, you know, in the following verses, 15 and 16, he says, what is the outcome then? You know, if, if, you know, I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. So that's his point. We need, when we pray, we need to pray with spirit and with mind. You know, the whole body needs to be involved in there. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. Otherwise, if, if that's not the case, if we don't know what we're saying, otherwise, if you bless in spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen at the giving of your thanks? And so Paul's concern is if we are publicly praying in a tongue that's foreign to us, whether it's, you know, heavenly tongue or, or Latin or something or just a language, you know, so if, if you're a missionary and you're, you're in deepest, darkest Africa and you're only praying in English, you don't have an interpreter around, the, the concern that Paul has scripturally is that the people won't be able to respond amen because they're just going to sit there and they're not going to know what you said. They're, they're going to have no understanding of, of what you just prayed. And so it's actually a detriment for the people if you're praying in a tongue that they don't understand. So that's why the Westminster Divines end, you know, if vocal, if you're praying out loud, it needs to be done in a known tongue. Now, if you're by yourself and you're a Latin scholar and you wanna pray in Latin, that's fine. You probably know the words. But if you're praying out loud and you're a bunch of, you're around a group of people who don't know Latin, you either need to find a translator or pray in the language that everybody knows. I was gonna say, one of the most, I guess, things that I remember about, I'm, one of our Mexican mission trips, we were have church at the at the seminary, and everybody was praying the Lord's prayer, but everybody was praying it in their own language. Mm -hmm. It was like it was really hit. It was powerful to me because I thought, well, we're all saying in different language, but God hears hears our hearts, mm -hmm. and here's you know, it was just uh, amazing to me. First time I'd ever been in that setting where everybody's praying their own language mm -hmm. and they're praying the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's a great reminder of, of that that diver the unity and diversity of, of the faith and recognize that we need to be praying in language that we understand, that that we're able to to all comprehend together because that's that's so important. You know, if we were all saying it in Latin and no one knew what we were saying, yeah. where's where's the beauty in that? There's it loses some of that beauty. Any other questions? All right, I've got one more article. Let me see if I can breeze through it. We got four minutes, three minutes. Article four, prayer is to be made for things lawful and for all sorts of men living or that shall live hereafter, but not for the dead, nor for those of whom it may be known that they have sinned the sin unto death. All right, so this is talking about lawful prayers. Lawful prayers are done lawfully. 1 John 3 verse 22 says, Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. So one way that prayers are done lawfully is if we're lawful in the sense that we're, we're, we're following God's commands. We're, we're trying to, to live a life that's pleasing to him. We're, we're confessing of our sins whenever we, we commit them. Uh, we are, we're praising God's grace and glory every time we see it present in our lives. Uh, you know, that's, that's a lawful way of, of prayer. Uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy 2.1, First of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. So not only are we praying lawfully according to the commands, we're also praying for other people. We're praying for all people, uh, you know, not just for certain people. That's, that was a certain, and Paul will go on in 2 Timothy 2 verse 2 to say, and for kings as well. You know, so the, the concern is the church was only praying for the church. They weren't praying for non-believers. They certainly weren't praying for Nero, that Christian killing king. You know, that <laughs> we need to pray for all people, all types of people, for, from the bond servant to the, the um, craftsman to the politician, the master. Who, everyone needs God's prayers. Uh, and that's another element of a lawful prayer. Now, everyone who, another element of lawful prayer is that it's for people who are alive. Or for people who are coming, you know, you could pray for a, a pregnant person uh, who's going to live hereafter. So you're going to pray for that baby, probably. Uh, but the confession says very clearly and plainly, not for the dead. So lawful prayers are not 
for the dead. Of course, this was a major concern for the Protestant reformers and the Westminster divines because that was a common practice in the Catholic Church. I mean, this that was one of the things that sparked the Reformation was the practice of indulgences, uh, which, uh, which you know, Luther saw, and, and these indulgences were essentially prayers that the Pope gave on behalf of deceased people so that they would, uh, you know, as, as a person, as the Pope prays for them, they will make their way, it'll shorten their time in purgatory so that they can then go on to heaven. That's, that's the practice of indulgence. And that practice is still around today. It looks a little bit different, but the Roman Catholic Church actually hasn't given up the doctrine of indulgences. They still teach it in their catechism. And, and of course, you have the, 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 the uh, is it the last rites? I think is what's called uh, the final unction, one of the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church. That's another thing that they have in mind here. That that last unction, that can be prayed. Generally, you think of it. You you think of a priest praying over someone who might be dying, and they say, "Oh, I need a, I need to pray." Well, that's actually the confession part. The final unction is when the priest prays for the person after he's dead. That person has died, and now this priest is going to say a prayer on on behalf of that dead person. The reformers are saying, "No, we don't need to pray for the dead because the dead." are already in God's hands. They're either in his hands as his redeemed children or in his hands as objects of his wrath. Uh, that's their people already in. And, and there's some scriptural references to that. Um, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 21 to 23, David here is praying for his dying infant. Uh, if you remember, David has that, that uh, adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. She actually becomes pregnant. And part of the punishment for that is that God is going to take the life of that infant. Uh, and, and here, Sam, David is praying for that baby. He says in verse, so second, second Samuel chapter 12, verse 21, then his servant said to him, so he's ta- this guy is talking to David, what is this thing that you have done? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. So, you know, he, the servant sees David. He's praying for this, this baby. He's praying on behalf of this child. He's, he's, he's interceding that, that God would relent and perhaps uh, not, not go through with taking the life of that child. He fasted, he did all this stuff. And then he says, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. As soon as that child died, you stopped praying. You stopped interceding on his behalf. And so the servant's like, why'd you do that? Why, why, why don't you continue praying for him even though he's dead? And, and David says to him, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. So David doesn't know the mind of God. David doesn't know whether God might relent or not. And, and so he's praying on behalf of this child so long as he's alive, even though he's, he might, he's sick and dying. Verse 33, but now that he has died, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? It, it, would my prayer resurrect this kid, this, this, this infant? No. He recognizes, and this is another important aspect of recognizing that you know, infants go to heaven. I will go to him, but he will not return to me. And so David, recognizing that now that, that his infant son is dead, he doesn't need to be praying for his well-being anymore because guess what? He's in heaven already. He's with God. And now, if anything needs to be prayed for, it needs to be David who needs praying that he will remain with God so that he will join his infant son. Uh, Jesus touches on this in the parable of, the, of uh, Lazarus and Dives, Lazarus and a rich man, Luke 16, verse 25 and 26. We know that story. Uh, and in that story, you know, Abraham says to Dives, the, the, the rich man, uh, child, remember that during your life, you received your good things and likewise, Lazarus, his bad things. But now he, Lazarus, is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. So when a person dies, elect or reprobate, to use Calvin's language, it's done. It's set. It's a done deal. You're either condemned or or you're redeemed. That's it. None of our prayers... First of all, our prayers on earth can't even change that anyways. But we can, we can certainly pray for a person in this life to recognize their election, or hopefully their, their election. We pray and preach that the gospel is, is heard and proclaimed. But once it's done, it's done. When we cross over to the other side, that's it. It's finished. Our prayers don't, are, are, are useless to the dead. 
because their, their fate is sealed. And so in this life, we don't know, as, as David says, I, I, who knows? The Lord may be gracious and let the child live. I don't, I don't know. I don't know God's will in this life. But in heaven, or on the other side of, of life, it becomes fully clear and fully apparent. And so that's, uh, that's the, the one there. And then this other phrase, which I do want to hopefully take a few minutes to unpack. I know we're over time. Um, this is one that I'm not sure how many of us have talked about this. So the phrase is, lawful prayers are neither for those of whom it may be known that they have sinned the sin unto death. How many of us have heard that phrase or, or used that phrase in our common, <laughs> common conversations? Probably not many, right? The sin of the have sinned the sin unto death. What is that? Well, that's from John chapter 5, verse 16, as we see in the, the little footnote there. And that verse says, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, so okay, pause there. If anyone sees a brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will for him. Give life to those who commit the sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make request for this. So John is saying, don't pray for that sin that leads to death. But pray definitely for the sin that doesn't lead to death. All right, so what is he talking about here? What's, what, it, what is John trying to get at? All right, well, when we look at, at this this passage, we need to look at the whole thing. And of course, we don't have time to really unpack all of 1 John chapter 5. Um, but, but it speaks of, of praying that God would give true believers life. Um, that's that's a, a little bit earlier in this. And so what, what you know, this is probably or could be referring to is spiritual resurrection life that had begun. So we're talking about a person who is regenerated, who has a spiritual resurrected life. And of course, all believers have that new life on this earth. It's not finalized or sealed until we die. And so that's one, one way of thinking about this life is it's resurrection life that's, that's begun. Uh, or it could be the physical resurrection life at the very end of history. Perhaps a person has died and, and we're waiting for, for that, that final resurrection. Um, that, there's two ways that scholars understand it. The first one, spiritual resurrection, that life has begun. That's the reformed view. That's what we're praying for life in this. Uh, in this. And so the opposite of that eternal life is the eternal death. Uh, which is likely here what he has in mind, that this sin that produces death is a sin that cuts a person off from God's blessed presence. So what, what is that sin, that sin? Well, by and large, when we look at the book of, of 1 John, it, it becomes clear that the sin that leads to death refers to the sin of apostasy, uh, which is unbelief in the gospel. And specifically, apostasy is something that a, a believer or a supposed believer commits. So a person who's a non-believer can't commit apostasy. They're already a non-believer. They, they, they never worshiped God. They never came to church. They, they knew nothing of Christ. They, they, they never worshiped God properly. They're an unbeliever. Apostasy is a sin that believers or people who are in the church can commit. These are people who are aware or come to church, have been coming to church. Uh, and of course, the apostasy that, that is the concern of, of the first century within, you know, before the church took off was the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. The scribes, the Pharisees, Israel had, had been living life almost like it was worshiping God, but in reality it wasn't. That was apostasy. And so that's the sin that leads to death. Apostasy is, is something that only false uh, professors of faith commit. People who, who say they have faith, but they really don't. Um, and, and so this, of course, is, is really what, what John is talking about uh, in John chapter, 1 John 3, verse 6 and 9. Uh, he, he, he affirms there that genuine Christians cannot keep on sinning. Meaning we, we cannot turn from God. If we're a true, genuine believer, we, we cannot turn from God. We may fall and stumble in the here and now, but there will, no, there will not be an ultimate turning away. An apostate turns away from God, ultimately turns away from God, leaves him utterly, which means he never actually had saving faith. 
That person was a wolf in sheep's clothing, as Jesus says. Uh, that person was uh, a false teacher, as Paul says, or a false. That person was not truly born again. Those who are truly born again will continue to seek God in faith, in repentance. You know, we recognize people who, who are truly born again, we know when we've sinned, right? We know in our heart of hearts that we've committed a sin against God. And that brings contrition in our hearts. And of course, that leads to repentance, which leads to forgiveness. A person who's a false Christian, a person who is an apostate, will see the sin that they commit and say, there's nothing wrong with it. They'll say, oh, that's just, that's, that's the way I am. That's the way I live. I'll, God's going to forgive me. God, God, God loves me because he made me this way. I, you know, all these things that the apostasy refuses to repent from sins. And so this, again, is a person who, who, who's in the church, grows up in the church, goes to church, whatever. They know what sin is. So again, we're not talking to someone who's an unbeliever, someone who's never heard of sin. This is someone who knows what sin is. They know what God says is pleasing, and yet they still refuse to repent. They turn from God. That's apostasy. Um, they, and so the, the true believer will not commit the sin of final apostasy, which of course is, and then of course, the John, you know, here says that there's no point, essentially, you know, don't, don't pray for the person who is leading this, the sin that leads to death. Essentially, the apostate, the true apostate, we, we don't need to pray for them. They're, they're already leading, they're already spiritually dead. They're, they're, they're already in that, in that camp. They're not, they're not going to heaven. Rather, pray for those who are doing the sin that doesn't lead to death. You know, our, our everyday sins, our, our lies, our, our deceit, our, uh, our idolatry, our adultery, our, our, you know, all the sins that, that, that we all know that we commit, whether it's uh, everything from lust to wrath to greed to gossip, everything that's listed in, in the Bible. Those are the ones we need to be praying for because we know that if, if we're a true believer, what we're praying for is for that person to recognize, hey, that's a sin, and I need to confess my sin before God. But the person who refuses to see their sin, who refuses to repent from their sin, our prayers there are useless. They're like wind blowing off nowhere. It's, then it's not going to change anything. Because apostasy is a sin that leads to death. And of course, we're talking about eternal death. We're not talking about physical death. We're talking about eternal condemnation. All right, any questions on that? Wow, we're way over time now. Try to get through it all. It's a bit rough. All right, well, let me close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we, uh, again, want to thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, study your word and, and to look at the Westminster Confession. Uh, Lord, I pray that as we have looked at uh, what religious worship in, entails and as we will continue to look at it next week, Lord, I pray that you incite in our hearts, ignite in our hearts uh, a desire for right and true worship of your holy and precious name. May we focus only on, on Christ as the true mediator of our prayers. May we, may we trust in the Holy Spirit that, that he will intercede on our behalf, even though when we don't know how to pray. Let us come before you with, with true reverence, humility, and, and fear. And Lord, may our prayers be acceptable before your sight. May you help us to learn how to pray uh, so that we are praying uh, uh, according to what you desire. And so, Lord, I, I pray for us that we are able to, to leave from this place, uh, trusting in your word, growing in faithfulness, that we can come back uh, later this week or, or next time we're here to worship and praise your holy and precious name. I pray all this in the name of Christ, who is our Savior and our mediator. Amen and amen.